Thank you for coming to our development class this morning, which is Effective Workplace Communications. Today we have James M. Ferris, PhD, is a licensed marriage and family therapist and is a, cer is a certified as an employee assistance professional. Dr. Ferris was the first director of the Pacific Care Employee Assistance Program. He has also served as an administrator of the Kaiser Permanente Alcohol and Drug Treatment Program. Dr. Ferris's background includes the positions of clinical director of the National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependence in Orange, California, and the Chief of Operations for Community Solutions, a large human, re human services agency near San Jose, California. He has been on the faculty of Trinity College, a graduate school of behavioral science in Anaheim, California. He is the author of the book, Parents Who Care Too Much. Please help me welcome Dr. James Ferris. Nice, thank you. Thank you, Georgiana. Now I'm gonna tell you every Sunday I, I go to church and um, when I'm sitting in the back there, the pastor looks out and says, you know, uh, come on up, you know, I'm not gonna bite. So I think that I'm gonna all invite all of you up here because we're so small and this is not just a lecture. We're, I wanna get us, because we're gonna do much more of a seminar style. Can I get you up in the front here? You know, I promise I won't take a collection. Okay, good. Thank you so much for doing that, because it's a little bit cozier if we can get you up here. Um, I'm glad. Did everybody get one of these? That's the next question. Did you get a, a handout? Come on up to the front if you can. You know, some of you are coming in right now. Come on up over here, because we're going to be doing a little bit of interaction as well. All right, and get your hand out here. Because the handouts are important, we're going to be doing some work with them. All right, and you can sign in and get your hand out. Come on up to the front. Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. Effective Workplace Communication is the name of it. Okay. You're going to have to get a buddy eventually, so that's why I'm inviting you. Because we're going to be doing a little bit of interaction here. All right, good. Come on up. We'll wait till everybody gets a, a handout and bring you up here. I'll give you five dollars more if you could come up to the front here. Maybe ten. All right, at least five dollars more worth of wisdom here and advice. No, no, that's fine. I'm glad that people are bringing us in. We're glad, if you have something to eat, please bring it up to the, with you. It's fine. There's no problem with that. Just pretend you're watching TV here. Okay, good. Come on up. You're going to get a buddy eventually, so we want you to get somebody to be with you. And um, we're going to be a little bit interactive. Okay, good. And eventually, if we have some questions and so forth, the re one of the reasons why I want you up here is because we don't pick things up except on that microphone, and I have to hand it over seats. You know, so if you have a question or a comment to make, we have to hand you the microphone, and so I have to stretch a lot. And I've just been to the gym yesterday, so I'm not ready today yet. Okay? Good. All right, effective workplace communication. You came here hoping to find out a little bit more about how to be effective in communicating with other people at work. And really, that, this could be anywhere, not just at work. So <clears throat> if you're looking at effective workplace communication, the thing about it is that we are talking about the word effective. Now, I'm going to start with a little story about my grandson. And my grandson um, wanted to go to Ruby's. Do you have Ruby's up here in Long Beach? Yeah, okay. So he wanted to, he lives up in Northern California and he wanted to go to Ruby's. And his mom and dad did not want to go to Ruby's. I didn't mind having a hamburger. But uh, so he started complaining, why don't we go to Ruby's? And I said, Sam, you know what? 
you're not going to get very far because you're arguing with your dad and your mom and it's not going to do much for you. You're not being effective. And so he said, again, he started complaining about, you know, uh, we're not going to Ruby's and I, we, I wanted to go to Ruby's when we came down here. And, and I said again to him, Sam, you know, you're not listening to me. You know, you're not being effective. And so after a little bit more complaining, he finally said to me, how do I be, become effective? What do you mean by effective? And I said, well, I'm going to make a suggestion about how you can talk to your parents about going to Ruby's and how you can make a negotiated trade-off with them. Mom and Dad, we can go to Ruby's today, you know, and then we'll go on another day where you want to go. Does that work? And he tried that with his dad, and dad said, yeah, that sounds fine. And he learned a big lesson about negotiating and being effective. So I'm going to look behind me here and see that word effective is what you want. Now I'm going to tell you another story before we move on. I have a friend who got a divorce. And uh, he was, before he got a divorce, which was about 10 years ago, he was always telling me about his rights. He was saying, well, you know, as a husband, don't I have a right? And I said, you know, you're, not, you're talking about being right and having your rights, but you're not being very effective in what you're doing with your wife. And so he continued on that path for a long time, talking about his rights. And lo and behold, a year after he started talking about his rights, they got a divorce. So I asked him, well, do you have your rights now? And that was a hard question, wasn't it? Because certainly, whatever rights he had, he still had. But he is now no longer married. So the question is then, how do you become effective? in what you're doing. In other words, how do you keep your eyes on the prize? You know what I mean by eyes on the prize? What your prize is, is your goal. What is the goal that you want to accomplish? What is it really clearly that you want to say to somebody? What are you hoping for as a response from them? What is it that you're seeking? Too often people don't ask that question. They just want to be right. They just want to have the last word. They have moved the issue from what they want to achieve to becoming justified in what they're doing. And with that said, we're going to look a little bit at what the problem is with that and how to overcome that. Because it's all between your ears. Do you know what I mean by between your ears? That's where it's all going on. You think about that. My friend who got the divorce, it was going on between his ears, wasn't it? About what his rights were. My grandson who wanted to go to Ruby's, the argumentation really was between his ears. It was in his own mind and he wasn't asking himself some very important questions about being, what's the operative word? A little bit louder. Thank you so much. We're getting you on tape here, see? Okay, good. So let's look a little bit. We're going to look at some effective communication, some positive interactions, and understand the process of effective listening. So to determine these strategies of how to provide feedback. Because what we're doing, like I was doing with Sam, my grandson, was to shape and you can write that in big letters somewhere, S-H-A-P-E, shape people's response. And you have a lot of ability to do that. You have a lot of ability to shape the response that people give to you. You certainly do have that. You know, if you look at the beautiful things of Michelangelo, like the Pieta, or David, or whatever it is that he carved out, when they asked him when he was working on one piece of work, and they said to Michelangelo, Michelangelo, you're chipping, you know, 
what are you doing, meaning what is it that he's carving? And his answer was, I'm freeing the statue from this stone. Isn't that an interesting answer? I'm freeing it. He could see it in there, but he had to chip away until he got what he wanted, until he achieved the vision that he had originally sought. So he was chipping away the stone. That's a different way of thinking about, about creating this statue. You and I may not think like that. Well, you might think, well, how the heck am I going to put this thing together? You know, How am I going to uh, chip away this? So he already saw the statue there in his mind's eye, and he was chipping away everything that wasn't part of that vision. So we're going to look a little bit what you think about what you think that you're communicating and what you are actually communicating are two different things. I want you to remember that. Those are two different things. What you are communicating and what you think you're communicating. Because what's going on is internal and external. What's internal is going on in what we call the self. You have a set of things that you're talking about. You know, I see this all the time when I'm talking to my wife. Because I say, well, you know, honey, I'm telling you this and that, and, and you know, I want to say this, and she looks at me like I'm nuts, you know. And she'll say, well, well I don't know, but, you know, and then we communicate back and forth, and pretty soon it gets a little bit more heated, and, and I thought I was saying this, and she thought I was saying that, or the opposite. Sometimes she'll say something. Isn't that how people argue? And then they scratch their heads and they really didn't say, no, that's not what I meant. You ever done that? Many times? Okay. Then I have to go out and buy more flowers, you know. So what is actually being heard is really what is received. I want you to remember that. That whatever is received is received in the way that the receiver receives it. That's a very important point. They don't receive it the way you intended it. That they received it in the way that, that they are listening and hearing things. That's an important point to make. You know, you're sending out the signals like on a radio, but their receiver is tuned in in a certain way. And it's colored by the way that they have lived. I can say one word to one group of people, and I can say the same word to another group of people, and it has different meanings, completely. And some people take offense, or some people are happy at words that we say. You just think about it, because it has the coloration of what it is that we have experienced. If I say the word father to you, it is colored by your experience of what your father is. It, to one person, that could be a joy, and to another, that could be a nightmare. It is the same with everything that we say, including the tone of how we say it, including how we say it. People have impressions from that. So the importance of clarification for mutual understanding is so very, very important. It really, really is. So. We are enhancing mutual communication. Pardon me for a minute while I come over here. And I want to have two uh, volunteers here. Can I get two courageous people for the day? I'll give you a raise or I'll at least talk to your boss, okay? If you say yes. Is there anybody who could, could join me over here? I just need two People, I have a script for you. You don't have to do anything besides read the script. And I'm going to bring you up here as an example of something. Can I get two people? All right, here's one. Give him a hand. He's, the rest of you are chicken here. And one more. All right, good. One more. Oh, come on up here, yes. All right, and we have a mic for a, More applause. These people have courage. They have courage. All right, good. We're going to get you into the mic. We're going to have A and B. Now, this is a, 
this is going to be good. Are you ready? Read over your lines a little bit, A and B, and you have to speak into the mic so that we can pick that up. All right, so well, you can, there you go. All right. Now, listen carefully to this one. I wrote it myself. All right, and make it with lots of gusto so that we'll send you to Hollywood after this, all right? I can hear you all the way from across the room. Could you lower your voice? I happen to be working, unlike some of us. Why don't you keep out of my business? You seem to think that that's, that's your work, getting into everybody else's business. Look, I don't need to get into your boring life. I just need you to stop booming your big voice across the room. Could you do us all a favor? And could you do me a favor and keep out of my life? You're acting like you're the only one in the room, and you're always bossing the rest of us around. Wow. Give them a hand again. They did a good job. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was an example, an extreme example, of communication. Am I right about that? What did you notice about that communication? All right. Thank you, Georgia. What did you notice about that communication, Georgia? It's confrontational. Yeah, right from the get-go. Am I right about that? It's, and what was it about? It was about noise, but it sounds like those people had a history. Would you think so? All right. Look at all the stuff that you're picking up about that communication. It was only four lines. You know, four, back and forth. They each, each of them had a line, a line, a line, a line. All right. So what are you picking up about that? They had a history. What else? They, they, they don't like each other. Right. They are effective, ineffective. Are they talking about noise? They're talking about each other, aren't they? That's really what they're talking about. So in between the lines, we know that there's lots of trouble between them. Am I right about that? OK. So you see how much we can get from those lines that are very limited. I just discovered a whole you know, story for the next TV show that you see there. All right? I should write it up, maybe make a little bit more money here. But the point is that. Um, we got a lot because of the tone, which you two did very well. Maybe you, have you had practice in this? No, I'm just teasing. But uh, the tone that you took, you, you portrayed very well. And number two, uh, you really showed that they didn't achieve what they wanted all right, by that. So what types of communication do you need to get and what type do you need to give? This is a very important thing, you know, what do you need to receive and what do you need to say to people? The barriers to what you're saying and what you need to hear are these. They're personal, organizational, logistical, and technological. Okay, so the very first thing is ask yourself, what is it that you need when you talk to somebody, what is it that you need to, to receive from them? You, you might say, well, what kind of question is that? Because, you know, I need lots of different things from them. But really, what do you need, basically, when, when people are uh, talking with you? What is it that you generally need from them? We can do some analysis right now. What kinds of things? You need understanding, right? You need information. What else? Cooperation, right. Anything else? Effective listening, right. You need them to listen to what you're saying, not just presume that they know what you need. What else is there? Anything else? Right, they need to repeat things. Gosh, you have taken this class before. Maybe not, but the point is that it's not that hard to find out. So what is it that you need to give when you're talking to somebody? Feedback, right. You need to say back to them what it is that you're talking about. You need clarification about what the topic is. I gave you the example of how 
my wife and I have missed it, you know, with each other, bing, bang, you know, and we're just like, what? What did we say? And that's not what I meant, she says, or I say. Well, obviously, we missed the clarification. We didn't start from the get-go to say, this is what we're talking about. And so my wife and I, when we start to do that, we have a new rule in our house. I say, let's go sit in our chairs. We have these two big easy chairs in the living room. And when things start to get heated, I say, okay. So, or she says that. And we sit down. And then after that, we say, now what were we talking about? Why, was, why is sitting down so important? It does what? It calms you down. That's right. You have a different posture. You're not doing this. And then I said to you, have you ever done that in an argument with somebody? You're walking around the kitchen, walking around the living room, walking around the bedroom, arguing with them. It doesn't work, does it? So first of all, <clears throat> physically, you have to be in a posture of listening. So that's what I mean by personal. You know, you have to be in an attitude and a posture physically of listening. That is a very important point. When I talk to my grandson or my granddaughter, I really have to have eye contact with them to be effective. Why is that? Because then they're paying attention to me, and I'm paying attention to them. And is it just like this, Grandpa Jim? You know, No, it isn't. It's like there's a kind of a sense of my eyes meeting their eyes. There's something very human about that. Would you agree? You know, that's why we say to the people we love, honey, look into my eyes, right? So, because that's the thing. Looking into somebody's eyes, there's a contact that we make there. The old saying is that the eyes are the windows of the soul. And there's a lot to be said for that. So there's personal, there's organizational. You know, because in organizations we have ways of talking to each other or not talking to each other. Sometimes we're in an organization where there's a silo effect. You know what a silo effect is? In other words, no, you can't talk to them. You talk to your boss and the boss talks to them. You ever been in that kind of a situation? Yeah, there we are. My, my boss will talk to your boss. That kind of a thing. And that's because you have this silo here and this silo here, and you have to go up the silo and over and down the other silo. So that could be organizational that you're facing. The third thing is that it's logistical. Because where you are and how you're talking to somebody else, logistically, you know, you have to say, is it something which is, uh, we're going to have a meeting? Or is it something that I'm just going over to your office? Am I making a phone call? Are you in the same state with me? And the last one is technological. And that's the biggest one that has created problems lately. Why? You know why, what I'm talking about. Technologically, what happens? What is going on technologically that creates problems for us with being effective? Anybody out there? Go ahead. Courage, courage. Hmm? Surrounding noise, but there's also some ways that we communicate. There you go. No, we tweet, we email, we do all sorts of things. Most of us have this electronic leash. Do you have an electronic leash? No, you don't have one. Okay. Most of us have an electronic leash. Now, the leash is good. You know, because it keeps me tethered to the world in some ways, but it's also very limited. You know, it's very limited. And when you want a transaction with somebody and you're sending them something like email, email is meant for information. And if you ever find yourself doing this, capitals and underlining and, you know, uh, all kind of uh, grammar points that you're making here, you're doing the wrong thing. Because that's not how you get transactional. 
with people. That's how you make them angry, to be honest. Capitalizing, underlining, rawr, 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 I'm angry with you, you know. And so those of us who did not grow up with all this technology, you know, like my grandchildren, we sometimes have to learn that lesson. I talk about the pastor in my church. He, he's a little bit younger than I am, and he sent out an email with some capitals, meaning he thought this was important because of giving some dates. People wrote back to him, why are you angry? <laughs> he said, I wasn't angry. He said, I just thought that this would be an emphasis. So I told him, that's not how you emphasize. <laughs> Because it, when you have all these capitals, you know, and uh, big marks and so forth, you know, <clears throat> underlining, that means to most people something's wrong and you better pay attention. And so that, like, maybe you're angry about things. So we want to maintain some good guidelines uh, for effective communication, make clear messages, communicate assertively, and actively listen. Okay, so... You're following along, hopefully, in this page that you've received because it is um, the handout and it has all the slides on it that are there. So what I'd like you to do right now uh, is to turn there in the back to page 12 and follow along with me because the next few slides... We're going to be talking about this. For, for effective communication, you have to be direct, honest, and respectful. And if you're not direct, honest, and respectful, you're going to be flubbing it up. You're going to be making mistakes. You're going to end up with some of this stuff that's here. And you're no longer assertive. Because this is really what assertive communication is all about. People are sometimes asking, what is assertive communication? And I'm going to tell you, this, these three things are the description of assertive communication. It's direct communication. <clears throat> it's honest. You're not trying to manipulate people in your communication. And it's respectful. In other words, you're talking to them, even if they're on opposite sides of an argument with you, you're talking with them about, um, about in a way that you respect them. You're not attacking them. You might be disagreeing with their idea. That's a very important point. Yes. Uh, yes, that's right. But uh, what I'm saying about page 12 here is that th this is all the stuff that you're violating if you're not doing that. So we'll go to that in a minute. Okay. So here's your next slide. And I gave you the answers already for that. Okay. That's why I'm pointing that out to you. Because there you go. We're on, we're on track. But, uh, but on this one, you don't have the answers filled in there. So you have all kinds of communication. And you're going to be looking at... Um, this page on 12 has the answers for this slide. Okay? It tells you what it is. Here is what I'd like you to do. I told you that you have a buddy. We have a buddy system going on here. I want you to find your buddy for the moment, and I would like you to make this determination. Where is your most difficult part of communication at work? I mean, where, where do you have... You don't have to name names. We're not asking you to do that. But what kind of communication, you know, is it within your group, between your group and other groups, you know, like your department and other department? Is it with your boss? What is it? Where do you have some big issues of communication and being effective? Can we do that for about five minutes? And then take turns, because if you talk to somebody, we don't want you telling them the whole story and not giving them of time. So I'm going to let you look at a buddy around here and talk to them about where your communication needs are, where your problems are. You can get together with more than one person if you want, but keep it to about two or three. Can we do that right now?
All right, did everyone share? Get a chance? 